So like she said, I'm Tyler Allen. I'm a scientist or currently a cancer biologist at Duke University's Cancer Institute. And so today, I just want to give a chance to talk about my background, some of uh, how I really became interested in science and STEM, and then my journey through um, both undergrad, grad school, and then now where I am now as a scientist at uh, Duke's University. But, well, anyway, so I'm going to, uh, while they're figuring that out, just introduce or talk about some of my background. Um, uh, so I was born in Texas, in Houston, and so I've moved here right before high school. And so I went to high school actually in Durham, not too uh, far from here. And I went to a school called Northern High School. And I went there for two years before I transferred actually to um, Middle College High School, which is actually at Durham Tech. And that's an early college program that they have through Durham Tech. So I'm actually uh, very familiar with the uh, community college scene. And that school is actually on their campus. So I actually attended there for both my junior and senior year before I went to state for uh, undergrad. And that was um, even before then, I'd kind of known that science or biology was where I wanted to be or what I wanted to do in life. It was. Um, I always tell the story when I was in my middle school. I don't know if they still do this now, but well, someone said that they did earlier. But you know that experiment where you like have a cheek swab and then you take it and you look at it under the uh, the microscope. Like I remember we did that, and this was this was in middle school back when I was still in Texas. And I remember just looking at my cells under the microscope, and I was just so so in awe, or enthralled by what I was seeing. It was like a whole another world or a whole another universe that I you know had never seen before. And I remember that was kind of. That was the, the moment where it kind of clicked in my head. I was like, oh, man, biology and science, this is actually really cool. You know, I want to I get interested in this. And, and you know, as I progressed through high school, and that, uh, I guess those courses were always the ones I was drawn the, towards the most, like the sciences, and especially biology and, and those type of areas. And they're always the, the ones that I seemed to do the, the best in or most interested in. And it was always because of those, you know, those cheek cells under the microscope. But um, so when I, I graduated from uh, middle college at Durham Tech, I went to state, and I knew um, immediately that I wanted to study biology, or that I wanted to do um, bio, or biological sciences. Um, so I studied, or I majored in biology, and then I double majored actually in human, or cellular and molecular biology, and then plant biology, both at, um, at state. And so I, I started doing um, like pre-med requisites, thinking that maybe at the time I wanted to go to medical school. Um, but I found out quickly that wasn't the path for me. I did some shadowing, um, and I did some like, medical programs. And I realized that the clinical setting wasn't really where my passion was. It was uh, I was interested in medicine and biomedical, uh, the biomedical field, but uh, that area wasn't what I was really drawn to. It was more the research side of things that I found myself most interested in. So that's kind of where I started um, in undergrad doing undergraduate research. So the first lab that I worked in, it was a, a plant biology lab. It was, it was funny, it's uh, like completely different from anything I'm doing now. They worked with, like they had like these huge rooms of just genetically modified plants that they would grow up and they would do tests on uh, like different drug uh, biosynthesis in these plants. And it was a genetics laboratory. And this was the, the first kind of dabble that I had in research or any type of research at all. And it was, um, I remember, because it was distinctly, they had these, they had me doing like, <laughs> it was so funny, I was like washing stuff and like doing a bunch of grunt work. And then sometimes though, after I had finished that, they would let me actually do some of the experiments and I was actually getting a chance to uh, get involved in the research side of things. And so that was actually a really rewarding process because it really opened my eyes to the world of biomedical research or just not even biomedical, but just biological and genetic research. And that's when I was like, okay, this is actually really interesting. Like learning about different genes or learning about how different things in biology affecting pathways and that sort of thing. And so I became interested in research, but I wanted to do something more in the, uh, the biomedical side. Oh, this, I didn't realize the, uh, <laughs> the slides came up yet. But um, so this is kind of was what I was talking about before. So I, I was actually the slide I wanted to go. So I shifted from a plant biology lab to working at the vet school at NC State. And so I was doing, this was still when I was an undergrad. Uh, this was my junior year, third year, and I switched to doing research at the vet school, and it was more biomedical focused, or it was more looking at the uh, biomedical side of things instead of 
uh, genetics. And so I worked with a professor here, and his name was Dr. John Horwitz, and he was a cancer biologist, or he actually still is a cancer biologist at State. And so I worked with him, and we were looking at uh, how these two different proteins that are involved in cancer actually are um, interacting with one another, and then that's effect on cancer and the progression of cancer. So this was the first time I had any type of cancer biology research um, at all. And so this was, this was really when I kind of caught the bug for this type of biomedical research, was when I did it in undergrad at the vet school. And it was, I remember as soon as I started, the first few weeks that I started doing this research, it was a completely different feeling from how I was, or what I was experiencing at the lab before. It was a completely different type. I was using different techniques, different types of uh, models to study this, looking at different parts of the uh, the genetic pathway in the body, and I loved it. Like when I tell you I loved this, it was it was one, like it was, and I think it was because it was such a great environment. Like the um, the professor I was working with, the research technician, they were all great, very supportive and helpful um, in my understanding of this process and, and research in general. And I think that was uh, really one of the defining points for me in terms of where I wanted to go next in my life in terms of research and science and that sort of thing. So I, 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 I emphasize that just to say, you know, whenever you're you know, experiencing things or doing things early on, it's very important to make sure that you, you're able to get um, different experiences. Even if you are interested in, in one thing, you know, finding multiple ways to get different type of perspectives from that same thing is important because you never know how one environment or one thing is going to influence how you, um, how you interact or how you uh, look at some type of thing. Like if I had stayed in the lab I was at before, who knows if I would have chosen to go down the same path that I did before if I would have done it. Even though I did like doing research and I really had a great time in that lab, it was completely different from the, the lab I switched into. And I'm grateful for that because it showed me a lot of different perspectives of doing research and just science in general that I wouldn't have been exposed to before. And so because of that and because of the, the research and the time that I had in undergrad, I knew that I wanted to do biomedical research uh, in graduate school. So I, I went to, or I applied to grad school at the, um, College of Veterinary Medicine at State. And so my program, or my uh, PhD, is in comparative biomedical sciences. And it was actually through the, uh, the vet school at State. So I stayed there uh, for my PhD. And I kind of, I switched topics, or I switched uh, fields. I was doing cancer biology, like I said before, in undergrad. And then, oh, oh, here's the, a picture of me. This is back when I was an undergrad. You can tell this a while ago, because I, I still had hair. <laughs> This is several years. This is back when I was an undergrad. This is a picture of the show, the, um, the lab I worked in doing uh, undergraduate research um, at the vet school. And so, but when I came to, um, to grad school, but so I, I started grad school um, at State and right after, and so I went directly from undergrad to grad school because I, because of the, the research that I had done and because of the experience I had in undergrad, I kind of, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that this was the field that I wanted to go into and this was the, uh, the type of biomedical stuff. And just so, a lot of times when I tell people like I worked uh, in a biomedical lab or stuff, they, they're like what, like, what were you doing in there? So I, sometimes I add these, um, well, these, well these, are, these were videos of like um, what I do in the lab sometimes, but it's just me like pipetting stuff and like doing stuff in the lab. But um, I like to show these just to get kind of, or give a better idea of what kind of stuff it means when you say you're doing research or biomedical research. Because sometimes, one time I, uh, I said to one of my friends, like, yeah, I work in a, a bio, this was in grad school or maybe undergrad, but I said, I work in a biomedical research laboratory doing research. And they're like, oh, research. So you're like, you know, reading books and like, you know, reporting back to your professor what you read about in the book and that kind of stuff. And so I always like to give a visual, because uh, I'm a very visual person, of uh, what I mean or what I do in the, uh, the laboratory. So it means I was actually doing experiments, trying to answer a question based on uh, some type of scientific hypothesis that was, um, I guess, created or led or designed in the laboratory before or while I was there. So I'm going to now kind of tell you a little bit more in depth about what my actual research project in graduate school was and then how this led to the discovery that um, was why I was named on the Forbes list. But it all started actually not with cancer. It started with, um, with heart disease. Um, so I, in grad school, I joined a professor at the, uh, the vet school's lab. He's a biomedical engineer, and he 
Uh, his name's Dr. Kay Chang, and he does regenerative medicine. And all that means is he looks at uh, tissues and when they're damaged, how to regenerate or heal them using uh, what's known as stem cells. So that was what I was initially doing in graduate school. I was looking at heart disease, and specifically when people get heart disease, how we can use stem cells to help treat them or help to um, regenerate the heart for therapy. Because um, you might not know, but uh, heart disease is actually the leading cause of death worldwide, uh, not just in America, but across the board, like across the globe. It's the leading or the number one cause of death worldwide with uh, cancer being up there as well, right, uh, right behind it. So this was, um, this was something that I was interested in understanding. And specifically, I was looking at this process called stem cell infusion therapy. So this was, uh, I'm not sure if my videos are gonna work, but yeah, no, no, no videos aren't working. But so anyways, so this was a, um, this video shows a process known as uh, stem cell infusion therapy, and that's essentially just where you have stem cells, which are just cells that can turn into multiple different types of cells, and when they're introduced sometimes to damaged tissue, they can replace that damaged tissue and then help with the regeneration of a damaged organ, specifically in this case, a damaged heart. So say when you have like a heart attack, um, you know, essentially what happened is you have these veins that provide oxygen to the heart, one of these will become clogged or kind of closed, and then it'll cause the area around here to actually die. So once it has uh, its oxygen source um, removed or inhibited, this area or this tissue around here will start to die. And that's essentially what's happening when someone has a heart attack, is they're getting, or there are um, areas where the heart isn't getting oxygen, and this is causing it, or partially, the uh, heart to die. So what we can do is if we infuse or if we inject stem cells into a person's bloodstream, these stem cells have the ability to find and then home in on damaged tissue and then actually uh, target and find wherever this damaged heart tissue is and then help with um, either the um, prevention of the disease progression or helping to heal the damaged heart. And one of the, the dangerous things about heart disease is that um, usually the heart isn't meant to regenerate, so it's, uh, it's, not, it's really not built to have a lot of damage to it. So it's very, you know, sturdy muscle and it's uh, under optimal conditions, it'll last for your, your life without being damaged. But uh, a lot of times with heart disease, it'll become damaged and since it's not meant to regenerate itself, it'll have trouble um, healing itself. So that's why we use stem cells to kind of help mitigate or kind of treat that, uh, the disease. But the question that I specifically want to answer that I was looking at was when we, so remember I said you can inject the, uh, the cells into your bloodstream and they can home in and then find that damaged tissue. But um, how specifically the cells, or the stem cells, when they're in the circulation, here's a, here's a picture of a blood vessel. When they're in the circulation, when they're injected into the blood, how they exit the bloodstream or they exit the blood vessel and reach that damaged tissue was a question, and that was the um, beginning parts of my dissertation research, was understanding or characterizing how these stem cells, when they're in the bloodstream, how they're getting out, and then how they're helping to regenerate the heart. And so that was, that was pretty much the first project that I was working on um, in graduate school. And I did a few different things to answer this question. Um, I guess, and to step back a bit, so there was, there was previous research before me that talked about, uh, or they knew that these, these stem cells actually were getting out of the blood vessel, and so there were trials or therapies done before where they actually, they had injected uh, stem cells into the bloodstream, and then they waited for a specific amount of time, and they came back, and they looked at the, uh, the organ, like the heart, and they saw that the cells were then in the heart from out of the, uh, the bloodstream. So they knew that somehow these cells were getting out of the blood and then reaching the heart, but how specifically they were doing that or what mechanism or method they were using hadn't been discovered yet. So that was the focus of my research, was figuring out how they were exiting or how they were uh, getting out. So what I did is I used a, um, a zebrafish or zebrafish embryos to help understand this question. And you might ask, well, why, why are you using zebrafish to understand you know, heart disease in humans or, you know, or this process? Um, but I, I, have a, I have a question. I've got a, a prize for someone if you, whoever gets closest to the, uh, this question. So this is a, uh, 
This is a magnetic um, bottle of fake like media that you would use to grow cells in. So I'm going to give this to someone, but you've got to answer a question. Whoever's closest to the answer after like a few tries gets this prize. And so take a wild guess when you, um, when you so zebrafish. Zebrafish are just a type of fish. Uh, they're called zebrafish because they have these stripes on them and makes them look like zebras. But um, take a guess as to how or what percentage you would say zebrafish share with humans um, in their protein coding region of their DNA. So basically, how similar do you think zebrafish are to humans? So what percentage from 0% to 100%? 98%. 98? OK. Who else? So I'm not going to say until whoever's closest, then they're going to get it. So a few people answer. 78. 78? OK. 74? 65. 65? 69. 99. 99? I was going to say 79. 70? I was going to say 79. 99? 80? 80? 67? 67? 82? Okay. It's like that, uh, that game where it's like the person <laughs> tries to say the one right or the other. <laughs> what is that? The price is right. And that's the one. <laughs> Online, Malak says 65, Cynthia says 87, and Chisholm Devetto says 90, so they want a prize. Okay, all right. <laughs> I have to make sure they're not like Googling it right now or something. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. So I'm trying to remember. So someone was almost on, and I think it was you. So you said 78, correct? Yep, you're the closest one. So yeah. yeah. So you, you get it. Yeah. So, so, but I, uh, I say that to, or I guess I use the experiment to kind of just uh, as a, a nice way to, to illustrate how similar the similarities in the genetic or DNA um, regions of humans and zebrafish to tell you that zebrafish are actually used as models a lot of times for studying human diseases or even um, other. I was actually talking earlier, she was talking about a, a frogs, xenopus. Frogs are actually sometimes used to study human or biological processes as well because uh, humans and other animals like zebrafish and even mice and rats have a lot of shared or common biology that are the same or similar between the two species. So if you want to look at a biological process, a lot of times what you can do instead of trying to work with uh, humans or human tissue or human cells, you can look at that problem or that same phenomenon in a different species that you're able to manipulate differently. So the beautiful thing about zebrafish is that there's a transgenic or a genetically modified line, this one that I use specifically, that has all of the blood vessels are fluorescent or pretty much they just glow green. So like this, uh, this one here, so all these, you see these are blood vessels in green. This is how it usually looks. This is just a normal image. This is that, um, two days old, so this is 48 hours after they've been born, this is what they look like. So they kind of look like little tadpoles almost, but this is uh, at the embryonic stage. But this is what they look like. So I may be able to actually under the microscope with um, when I'm looking at them see in real time what their blood vessels are doing and how they look and then how they're responding to uh, cells when they're injected into the circulation or into the bloodstream. So what I do is I take, um, I take stem cells that are also uh, fluorescent or glowing a different color, and I inject them into the uh, the zebrafish or the embryo. So here, this is kind of the setup that I use. This is the uh, it's called a micro injector, and it's kind of hard to see, but this this thing right here, it's like a small, fine little needle. And what you're able to do is actually load uh, cells, human cells, or a human or any other type of uh, species cells into this needle, this micro injector, and it's got like a fine little point that comes down that you can inject into the, uh, the circulation of the, uh, the zebrafish. And so this is, this is cool because, so it looks, um, I guess I've got it blown up here, but this zebrafish is literally at 48 hours, it's the size of a period, like on, the, on a piece of paper, like just a dot on a piece of paper. So this is a very like blown up image, but even here it's like, it's like just a little dot on the thing, so it's like a, a microscope. You have a yeah, question? Uh, Malak? Online's got a question. Even though you use zebrafish embryos, he's like, why didn't you use HeLa cells? Wouldn't that be just as efficient? And he mentions the fact that they've been used in breakthroughs in lots of different areas. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. So um, the question was, why didn't I use HeLa cells, which are a type of cancer cell that's been 
used a lot for um, discoveries of biological processes. They actually used those cells to discover the polio vaccine and a lot of other processes in biology. So actually, it's funny that he asked about those. I used those later. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about this, but I do use those later for an experiment later. But this one, I needed to use um, stem cells to specifically look at how the um, process in humans was affecting or occurring with stem cells. And HeLa cells, those are a type of cancer or tumor cells. So they're, um, the reason I didn't use HeLa cells is because I wasn't interested at that time in understanding how cancer cells exit. I need specifically to know how stem cells exited, so I couldn't use the HeLa cells. That's an excellent question. And that also brings up a good point. If any of you all have any questions through the presentation or while I'm talking about anything, feel free to like raise your hand or ask me. I don't mind uh, answering questions while the presentation. It actually might make it more interesting, so feel free to, to do that. But um, let's see, where was I at? So yeah, so, so what I'm doing, so I can inject um, stem cells directly into the circulation of the zebrafish. And then, like on the previous slide, since the blood vessels are all fluorescent or glowing, I can see under the microscope how those cells are traveling around in the, the zebrafish. And then, specifically, what I'm looking at, remember, is I'm interested in how do they exit the blood vessel or how do they exit the circulation uh, once they're inside. And so that was the question that I was trying to answer, and that's why I use this model, is because a few reasons I use zebrafish. One, because they're completely transparent at the embryonic stage. So for the first few days of life, they're completely transparent. So if you look at them under a microscope, you can see completely through them. So if you inject something, you can see uh, there's no like skin, or, or there's skin, but there's no, um, I guess, pigmentation that's preventing you from seeing all the way through. And uh, another reason is that at this stage, their immune system, or a part of their immune system, is not fully developed. So you can introduce foreign cells or foreign tissue into the zebrafish, and their body won't recognize or won't reject it. So say if you had like uh, one of us, since we have functioning immune systems, if you were to take like a piece of your tissue and try to put it into me or some of your cells and put it into me, my body would immediately uh, recognize that this is a foreign piece of tissue, and it would kill or attack that um, those cells or that tissue. But with the zebrafish, since they're at the embryonic stage, their immune system hasn't developed yet, so you're able to introduce cells and then do experiments without their body uh, recognizing or realizing that something is uh, foreign. So what, um, so what I do, so, so I said, so I inject the, uh, the cells right around here, and this is kind of where the heart is. Um, I wish I had the, uh, so in the video of the one before, you could actually, it's uh, that one before that I showed with the zebrafish, you could see um, it's a beating heart of the, uh, the fish. But this is where I, I do the injection, kind of right before the heart area, and then it'll go through the heart and then travel through the rest of the body and through the rest of the, uh, the vasculature. And then once it gets stuck in one part of the blood vessel, I'll do what's known as light sheet microscopy. And all that means is I'll look at it in a, a microscope that I'm able to like submerge the zebrafish in, and I'm able to get these really high resolution images of the zebrafish blood vessels, and then how specifically, or and then see in real time how the cells are exiting the blood vessel or how they're getting out. And then, oops, this one. Did you use staining? So these actually, um, is that another, <laughs> another question? But um, so these were not uh, stained, so the blood vessels were, I guess they're fluorescent, but they're fluorescent because the zebrafish was genetically modified so that uh, the blood vessels exclusively would express or emit this, uh, what's known as green fluorescence protein or GFP. So this one, um, so staining is uh, another way to do it. And that's basically, it means like, so, the, so this is green and red, um, how is it that color? But um, the cells, the cells were actually stained with what's known as RFP, which is just red fluorescence protein. And so the, the cell, or the green cell, or the green blood vessels, those were expressing it because of their genetic modification. But the cells that were injected, those were labeled with another or a different fluorescent marker so that they're able to be distinguished from the blood vessels. But um, so this is, this is a zoomed in, uh, zoomed in picture. Ah, none, of my, none of my videos are working. Mm. Oh well. So that was a that was going to be a video that showed like in 3D the uh, the blood vessel being manipulated and going inside. But um, 
But I'll show you, so this is what we found to be the case with stem cells when they were injected into the bloodstream, is that they actually exited the vessels in a completely novel or a completely new way than was previously um, known or discovered. So what we did is we found, or we, we pretty much, we saw in the microscope, um, it looks like my videos aren't gonna work, but I'll describe what's happening in this video. Um, or in this animation is essentially when we injected the stem cells into the blood vessel, what we saw is that they would attach to the inside of the vessel and then the blood vessel wall would actually wrap around or restructure itself to wrap around the cell, the stem cell, and then actively push it out from the inside of the, uh, the blood vessel into the surrounding tissue where it could then interact or travel to the heart, the damaged heart tissue, and help with regeneration. And so since this was not, uh, or this was a completely new discovery, we, uh, we actually got to name it. And uh, the name is angiopelosis. And so angio is just um, Greek for, or no, it's Latin for uh, relating to blood vessel. And pelo, pelo is Greek for to drive or push out. So kind of stuck those two words together and their name was angiopelosis, which just is the method that stem cells use to exit blood vessels when they're infuse or when they're inside the circulation to reach damaged tissue. So this was, um, this was the, the first part of my dissertation research was the, uh, the characterization and the defining of this method of how stem cells are exiting the blood vessel and then how they're reaching the damaged tissue to help with the regeneration. And this is kind of, um, it's funny, so I was, you know, this is of course in um, cardiac or this was related to like heart therapies, but um, it kind of changed back or changed to cancer research because there's a, um, a similarity between something that happens with stem cells when in the circulation and then something that happens with cancer cells in the circulation. But so the next part of my dissertation work was looking at cancer cells and if this method of angiopelosis or them exiting the blood vessels was also able to be done by tumor or cancer cells. So cancer, as I'm sure you all know, is just when you have cells in the body that grow and grow and grow, and when they're told to stop or when they're not supposed to grow anymore, they don't listen to the body and they just keep growing and growing, and that's what causes uh, what's known as tumors. And when you have tumors in the body, there's a, so say you have like one tumor growing in the body, you'll have what's known as a primary tumor. So say that tumor is in like the breast and you'll have cancer in the breast and this breast cancer will form a tumor. And what happens is that or what, or when cancer becomes dangerous is when cells from that primary tumor actually will enter into the bloodstream or enter into the circulation. And then once they're in the bloodstream, like your, your circulation or your blood is pretty much like a highway access to your whole body. So your, the cells, the tumor cells can travel in the bloodstream and then they can exit out of the blood vessel in the form, uh, oops, in the form what's known as a secondary tumor. And so, so this is primary and this is going into the, the circulation. It'll travel to a distant site. So say you have breast cancer and it'll travel to like somewhere else. And then let's say it comes out of the blood vessel at your kidneys. And so you can have tumors that form uh, in your kidneys and it'll continue to grow from the breast cancer originally, but now it'll be breast cancer that's growing in your kidney. And this is a process known as metastasis, which is just when cancer spreads throughout the body. And actually 90% of the deaths from cancer are caused by or related to when it spreads throughout the body. So it's usually, if you have an isolated form of cancer, like just one in the breast only, that's a lot of times or more than likely able to be treated or at least, um, I guess, mitigated from, I guess, progressing. But when it spreads throughout the body, that's when it becomes a lot more dangerous. So similarly to uh, stem cells, the exact process of how tumor cells when they're in the circulation, how they exit was still unknown or wasn't completely characterized or defined. So my thought was, well, okay, so we know that the stem cells, they can use this angiopelosis method to, to exit. Could it be that tumor cells or cancer cells are using the same method or a similar method to exit blood vessels when they're during the metastasis process? So that was the, um, the kind of the shift 
from when I was doing um, heart research to when I shifted to cancer research. Yes. Is there a cell that regularly does this? Yes, there is actually. So it's um, the, the most common cell that extravasates in the bloodstream are white blood cells or leukocytes. So these are the immune uh, system cells and they, they undergo a process, uh, it has a specific name, it's called diapedesis. And this is essentially where the white blood cell, usually I have it in here, but sometimes it's like a very, uh, it's a confusing process sometimes, so sometimes I leave it out, but it's uh, essentially, you have white blood cells, and so white blood cells are found usually all throughout the body. They're the ones that when you have like a pathogen or a bacteria come into, they'll attack it, or um, if there's foreign tissue, they'll attack it. And so a lot of those are actually in the bloodstream as well. And so say like a virus or something gets into some of your body or your tissue, the white blood cells will actually, in the circulation, they'll exit exit uh, the blood vessel and they'll go and they'll find that bacteria and they'll like attack it or they'll kill it. And so white blood cells, they actually undergo a well-characterized method where they squeeze or they'll kind of pretty much squeeze through the, uh, the blood vessel and they'll, they'll change, they'll be like a, um, a circular and then they'll actually change into like a more of a, like a dumbbell shape and they'll squeeze through the, uh, the blood vessel wall and they'll travel and they'll attack the, um, what are the pathogen or virus they're, they're trying to get to. But, and it was thought for a long time that both stem cells and tumor cells actually use or do a similar thing where they squeeze through. But the, the only thing is that stem cells and tumor cells um, morphologically or just the um, physical nature of the, uh, the cells is much different from white blood cells. So white blood cells, they're um, able to be uh, manipulated morphologically much differently, and even their um, membranes or the, uh, the coating of the cell has different uh, what's known as receptors or proteins that interact with the end of or the uh, blood vessels differently than tumors and um, stem cells. So the, the hypothesis was that all these cells are all using the same method to exit, but um, my research was looking, or the kind of impetus from my research was the, the understanding that stem cells and cancer cells have very different uh, one morphological properties than white blood cells. And then their membranes or the proteins that are found on stem cells and cancer cells are very different and they don't have the ones that allow them to squeeze out specifically through the way that white blood cells do. So that was the reason that I was interested or that I, I guess at first had hypothesized that stem cells do exit in a different way from white blood cells. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. If we can. Is that question? Is, uh, you want to repeat the question? Yeah. So, like, what determines when the tumor cells exit the blood cell, and how would I control the Yeah. So that's a good question. She was asking. So, like, say you have a tumor cell in the bloodstream. So, what determines like when or where it comes out, or what is prompting it to exit the vessel and then um, form tumors? like somewhere else. Um, if you, you can figure that out, let me know. Because then we can cure it this together. <laughs> but uh, well, no, that's, a, that's actually a big question in the cancer field. It's um, how do uh, cells know? Because there have been experiments or research done in the past where they've um, artificially injected tumor cells into the bloodstream. And then certain types of tumor cells will exit at specific sites. So if you have like a breast cancer tumor cells, if you inject those into um, an artificial circulation, they'll exit at specific sites. Whereas say if you have like liver cancer, those cells will exit at completely different sites. And even in patients, like in the hospital, when we have or when we find patients that have cancers that have spread throughout the body, depending on the type of cancer that it is that it originates from, it will be found to have spread to more likely different types of places. So that's, there's, um, I guess there's research on that, but it's not even that question itself isn't completely understood in the cancer biology world of how specifically or what specific mechanism or properties is allowing cells to exit at specific sites. So if you find a, a way to answer that question, let me, let me know and we can, <laughs> we can work on that. But, um, but, so, but it's thought or it's hypothesized that there are specific um, I guess, or organ or tissue specific, um, what's known as chemokines or cytokines, which are just 
um, molecules that are emitted from tissue that cells or tumor cells are able to recognize and then this prompts them to exit at that point but that whole but the complete understanding of that is not uh, completely uh, worked out as of yet. Yes. So how does the stem cell know to go target the damaged tissue? Yeah, to exit that, when it's exited. That's a great question. So that's also completely not understood. But the hypothesis is similar. It's that uh, similar to with white blood cells. So when white blood cells, when you have, let's say, even a damaged um, tissue, white blood cells will go to that damaged tissue and help with um, or will start the process of like inflammation and regeneration for that sort of thing. And what happens is when you have a damaged tissue, like a heart tissue that becomes damaged, that damaged tissue or that area releases molecules in a gradient through the body. And the cells, the white blood cells, are actually able to sense that gradient. And then depending on the direction of the gradient, they're able to follow that gradient to find that damaged tissue. So it's hypothesized that stem cells and actually even some tumor cells are utilizing a, a similar method where they're following some type of um, molecule gradient and they're able to find it and exit that way. But it's, it's still not completely teased out the complete or the exact mechanism and if it is in fact the same as the white blood cells. But that's the, the kind of, at least now the general hypothesis of how they're doing it. But those are all great questions. Yeah. Malak has another question online. He's heard that when tumor cells enter the bloodstream, most of them die. Is that true? It is actually. So the uh, the process, so metastasis, which is when they just when they enter the bloodstream and they spread, is actually a very uh, inefficient process. So if you have, like I say, like all of these cells entered, that's unlikely, but say like all of them somehow injured and they were traveling through, there's a chance that all of these would die in the circulation or that maybe only one or a few out of them would even survive the trip. Because you have to think about it, so tumor cells, um, most tumors are not meant or most tumors are not formed in the blood. They're formed in either like an organ or tissue. So they're not used to the bloodstream. And that's a very, if you think about it, you know, you've got blood and you, you probably, you know, you can't really, uh, you don't see it now, but blood in your body is moving at a very uh, quick pace and it's a very harsh environment. So there's a lot of, you know, hemodynamic forces that are being um, dealt in the blood and there's pressure depending on the size of the artery or the vein that you're in in the body. And so that's a very rough environment. It's kind of like, like if you were a, grump, a group of people and you like jumped into a raging river that was just like you know a monsoon type of thing, it'd be a very uh, like harsh environment for you to become acclimated to or for you to become um, able to withstand. So it would be um, so similar with with tumor cells when they get into that system or when they get into the bloodstream, it's very harsh on them. So a lot of times they'll die from just the the. I guess results of that pressure, that change in system. And then too, you have to think about once they, so if they are lucky enough to travel through the you know, monsoon river and then make it through and then exit, they're now at a completely different or foreign, uh, foreign site from where they started. Uh, this is like where they like to be happy. So now they've traveled, they've somehow survived the bloodstream and they're in a completely new environment. So this is an environment that they're not used to, that they're not specialized to grow in, and that they're not, um, they don't have any uh, like other cells with them usually or other um, organs that they're native to. So they're in a completely different area. So most of them aren't able to um, form or they're not able to survive in this type of area. So that's, it's actually interesting because you know, cancer when it spreads is usually when it becomes most dangerous, but most cancers don't spread, or that's, it's actually a very rare process. It's just that when it does happen is when it becomes most dangerous, which is why we um, spend so much time on it, because those are the ones that are actually accounting for the majority of patient deaths. But it is a very inefficient process, so the, um, the question is a, is a correct one, where it's not that many that are able to survive, you know, jumping into the river and then growing at a new, um, new site. So we have another student who wants to know what type of stem cell was used for your initial work? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So these were specifically, we were looking at cardiac stem cells. So these are adult cardiac stem cells, or the question was what specific type of stem cell was used in the previous uh, experiments that I was talking about. 
This is a good question because, um, you know, I say stem cell, and that's kind of a, um, an umbrella or blanket term for lots of different types of things. So there are multiple types of stem cells. There are um, like stem cells in certain parts of the body, like um, your lung versus your heart. They both have stem cell or stem cell-like uh, cells that are very different. So these cells that I was using in this one before were adult cardiac stem cells. So what these were done with were, so you have, so a patient maybe has a heart attack. What you can do is you can take a small piece of the healthy part of that person's heart. You can then take that piece into a laboratory and then grow it uh, like in a, a petri dish or like a flask and then grow it and kind of expand the cells. And then you can use a technique where you can actually um, grow it in a specific way so that these cells form or they are introduced into a stem cell like um, a stem cell like mixture where they're able to then revert back into a stem cell type of cell or a stem cell like type of cell. And then you can use these cells for the infusion therapy that I was talking about before where you introduce them into the bloodstream and they travel to the damaged tissue. So these cells were specifically a, um, that I was talking about were adult uh, human cardiac stem cells that were used for this study before. Uh, let's see, now where was I? Any other questions before I move Is it on? difficult to culture those cells? Oh, yeah. Well, it depends. So, so some stem cells are tricky to, to grow, but um, the cardiac stem cells that we were using, these were, they were relatively easy. And the thing that we did to um, culture them specifically is so when you like, get a piece of the tissue, you're able to grow it in a petri dish, and then what reverts those cells back into a stem cell-like um, phenotype or stem cell-like tissue is that you can grow them on what's known as a low attachment flask. So usually when you grow cells, most cells, like say this is a, um, a dish. Uh, let's see, this is my bad drawing. Uh, so this is a petri dish, and you've got like a bunch of cells. I'm not an artist, so don't do <laughs> so what you do, so you can usually you'll have a bunch of cells that'll grow out from the cells that you put down on the uh, the plate. But what you can do is if you have what's known as a low attachment petri dish. Actually, let me draw. I'm gonna draw a flask. Or a low attachment flask. So this is this is a petri, and this is like a flask that you can grow cells in. And then this is just, um, so this is like media it's called, or it's basically just a liquid substance that provides nutrients for the cells. What you can do, you can take these stem cells and you'll actually put them in the flask and then allow them to just float around in the media. And what they'll do is they'll form these, what's known as spheroids or cardiac derived spheroid cells. And these cells, they'll kind of, they'll float around in the media and, the, and them floating as chunks allows them to enter a stem cell-like um, state where they can then be reintroduced into patients who have heart disease and help with regeneration. So these actually were, um, these were relatively easy to grow, but there are some stem cells that are more difficult, but these, these not so much. Uh, all good questions, though. Any others before I? Yes. So I read uh, one research paper that was talking about targeting cancer cells, and they were talking about It could, it could. So I guess the question was, so there's, with, um, I guess within tumors and with cancers a lot of times, sometimes there's a lot of communication between cells within the tumor microenvironment. And one way that that happens is through the exchange of reactive oxygen species from cell to cell. And so there's um, a lot of communication that allows the tumor cells to either communicate with one another or propagate to other um, cells in the, the tissue. So. Their question was, could that potentially be a similar method for how they're communicating with the, the blood vessel during this process? And 
that's a question that actually I don't know the answer to that question because that's uh, that's something that hasn't been looked at yet, at least in this setting. But there's no uh, so so maybe who <laughs> we'll have to do some experiments. I'm going to write these down and I do them later when I, I go back to the lab. Yeah, but no, that uh, that, that definitely could be a part of it. Who knows? But um, so now so where am I? <laughs> I got sidetracked on the uh, <laughs> the stem. So where was I at? So with this, um, oh yeah, so. So the, um, the next part I want to look, so we saw that the stem cells, they exited through this specific method. So my next question was if uh, tumor cells or cancer cells could also utilize a similar method to exit the blood vessel uh, that was different from how the white blood cells were squeezing through um, previously, which is how I guess tumor cells are thought to have exited before. So I did a similar experiment and this was, um, So I did a similar experiment where um, I injected tumor cells into the, um, the blood vessels of the zebrafish again. And, and this one is a different coloring, so the red is now the blood vessel. And then these uh, blue cells are actually the HeLa cells that I talked about earlier that I got the question about. So these uh, HeLa cells again, these are just a uh, tumor cell line that's been, uh, you can grow them like in a petri dish and you can grow them forever. And the great thing about them is that they're immortal and so, which is what makes them cancerous, meaning that they grow forever. So you could grow them in a flask or in a petri dish forever. They've been grown for decades at this point. So they were derived uh, sometime in the 1900s. I forget which specific uh, decade, but they've been grown um, pretty much in, in petri dishes or for decades and decades. And as long as they're um, continuing to be grown, you can grow them forever, which makes them great um, cell lines to use in a laboratory setting or for doing biomedical research because you can grow them forever, you can repeat experiments with them, and they're, um, it's very easy to work with and they grow very well and you're able to introduce them into different systems and you do lots of different stuff with them. So what I did is, instead of stem cells, now I use these tumor cells and we injected them into the bloodstream and then we observed them exit the, uh, the blood vessel and we found that they actually were able to use the, um, the method previously shown by the stem cells, the angiopelosis method that I talked about before. But the, um, the key difference in this one was that we noticed something interesting and it was that not only could uh, tumor cells exit with just one cell, but through this method, there could be multiple tumor cells that exit uh, together as groups or clusters. So here, it's kind of hard to see in this picture with the lighting, but this is a group of about three cells together that have exited the blood vessel. And then here is just one. And so this is at one day, and this is four days. And you can see, so this is a tumor cell, and this is after a few days. And you can see that this one that's uh, an individual or that exited by itself, it didn't, uh, or it hasn't grown. And usually tumor cells grow very quickly, like in the, a petri dish, uh, like after several days, there would be like a huge amount of growth. And in humans, if you have like a tumor, if like after a few days, usually there's a, that's when like a tumor is forming or a huge like mass will form after a, a certain amount of time, which is why you get tumors. And so what we saw is that the individual cells, they actually didn't exhibit the ability to grow or to uh, divide when it was just one of them. However, when it was multiple ones together, they showed, see here's the uh, same one after four days, the same one. You can see it's much bigger now. It's much um, more defined. This is more like when you have cancer in the body, this is pretty much what's happening is you have um, either one cell or a few cells that decide to keep growing when they're not supposed to, and then after a while, that cancer will form into a tumor or a tumor mass, which is what, uh, I guess, causes the uh, like tumor formation or the bulge that you see in some cancer patients. But, um, but the, the importance of this is this showed that when tumor cells exit ver as one versus a group, that they behave much differently. But the thing is that tumor cells before were not thought to be able to exit as groups. They were thought to only be able to exit as one cell by themselves. And that's because the method that I mentioned earlier with the white blood cells squeezing out, which is what people thought cancer cells did, only allows for one cell to squeeze out at a time. Um, it doesn't allow for multiple or if there's a group of cells to exit together because it's a very um, 
tight squeezing process. But this process, the angiopelosis method, since this is a complete restructuring of the blood vessel around the cell, it allows for it to exit by itself or to exit in groups or clusters and to exit um, with its friends pretty much. So it showed that the, um, or this is important because it showed that angiopelosis was the only method that clusters or groups of cells can use to exit, and that when they do this, they're much more likely to form what's known as the secondary tumors or the tumor masses. And I think I'm kind of like going, I'm going to rush through the next part because I think I'm a little bit behind. But um, so soon, this is just a video that shows over time the same video that I or the same picture over four days, but it just shows the uh, a 3D reconstruction of that tumor growing over four days, and you can see the. Um, the kind of has uh, 3D reconstruction of that one, and then this is the same. This is that one, the same one cell, and then again a 3D reconstruction that you can see over the course of four days. And you can see it moves a little bit, but it doesn't actually grow. And so this this is just to illustrate that point. And I think this is the end. So this is this video is not working, but essentially this is a video that just shows what I was um, describing, and it was that the uh, tumor cells they were found to be able to exit as both uh, clusters and uh, individual cells, but um, the clusters, they're able to, or they're only able to exit through the angiopelosis method, but when they use this method to uh, metastasize or to spread throughout the body, they're more likely to form secondary tumors, and this led to the discovery of what's known as the cancer excess hypothesis, which just states that the tumor cells or the uh, ability for cells to form secondary tumors is proportionate or is correlated to the size of the cluster that exits through angiopelosis in the, um, the body when the cell is traveling in the circulation. And the importance of this is because, so if we can understand this process better and what specific you know, uh, mechanism and molecules are involved in this, we can develop treatments or therapies that specifically target um, this pathway or these mechanisms to prevent or to treat the spread of cancer throughout the body and hopefully help with um, prevention of metastasis, which like I said before, is the leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide. And I think that's the, the end. Oh yeah, and then I had just three real quick things that I learned as a student. So this was all, so that was the completion of, of my, um, my grad school work was that, uh, that discovery. And so, um, but the, the three main things that I, that I did learn when both in undergrad and grad school was to you know, stay curious. Uh, a lot of with, especially with STEM research or just STEM in general, um, there's a lot of um, things that are still not known or areas that are still un, uh, uncharted that you really, you know, if you have a curious mind, you're really able to answer or help answer some type of question or advance some type of field. So definitely remember to stay curious because that's, uh, when you have that curiosity, it makes it a lot easier to go through all the, uh, the things or challenges that you're going to have to face that I um, probably, I guess, didn't talk about. But there are a lot of things that didn't work uh, <laughs> in this thing. I'm, I'm showing you all the stuff that, that did work. But still, staying curious about your question makes it easier to, uh, to go through all that. And then you know, the second one is, I say this all the time, at least try. At least try. So I, I can't tell you how many times I've done things or I've been able to have some type of scientific breakthrough and just personal breakthrough from just trying, from just trying something. Like even you know, if you think you might not get it or you might not do it or you might not be good at it or you might have no chance you know, in accomplishing something like that, at least try. Because you know, like they say, what's the worst that could happen? You'll fail. But if you do succeed, like, you know, then it's completely worth it. So at least try, at least try. And then lastly, you know, be selective about what advice you take. So um, you know, for example, when I was looking at stem cells and I wanted to switch to looking at a completely different field or completely different thing with cancer biology, I did get some, uh, I guess, pushback from, because you know, it's kind of uncommon in grad school to go to a completely different field after you've like worked on one thing for another. And that's just one example, but in life, you know, be, uh, of course, take advice from people and be receptive and open, but no one knows you like you know yourself. No one knows your strengths. No one knows your abilities better than you know them. So even if you know, someone is telling you to do something, I always stress this, it's got to be about what you want to do and make sure that you are the one who are making the decisions 
and then um, not necessarily only listening to what people are telling you because people a lot of times will tell you based on their own um, their own experience or their own limitations but you're definitely not the same as anyone else so be able to of course be receptive but make sure that you you don't have to take every single advice that you get you have to uh, I guess be able to learn and accept things for yourself and know that you're going to have to do some things on your own if you really want to I guess make that that switch from like the great people you are to the outstanding or the outstanding people that you're going to be. And I think that's that's it for me. So thank you so much. This is the quote I like to leave everyone with. You have all the tools necessary to build whatever future you want. All you've got to do is just figure out, figure out how to use them. But thank you so much for for bringing me. I appreciate it.